you know, we talk about planting switchgrass a lot because it's fairly cheap, fairly easy. And, um, and it's a very effective screen complement to bedding cover. It's not bedding cover itself, typically. Um, I don't like switchgrass referred to as bedding in a bag, those kind of things, because it really isn't bedding cover. Uh, it's escape cover. It could be holding cover for rabbits. Um, bedding cover in the summer for fawning grounds, um, where those fawns don't rely on the browse that's around them. They rely on the mother's milk to uh, keep them alive. So they're just bedding in there. But deer need to feed five times in a 24-hour period. So if they're in 10 acres of switch, they have to leave the cover to go find food because switch is not food. So, but bottom line is, and if there's food in there mixed with clover, alfalfa, whatever type of food someone might actually potentially include in that switchgrass mix, then there's not enough cover for it to be cover. You can't have one without getting rid of the other. So if there's appreciable browse, there's not enough cover. If it's all cover, there's no browse. So you can't have both. Yeah, I mean, you just really literally can't. It doesn't even matter if it's a pheasant. You can't have both because there's not enough cover then during the fall and winter. So switchgrass is easy, but timing is everything. I'm going to recommend really quick, read your label. We have a label out there that's uh, 40, the germination rate is 41%. That means if you buy 10 pounds of switchgrass, you'll get about six pounds that is just fluff and filler. That's hard seed that's not going to germinate till possibly the following year. So if the germination rate is 41%, you're paying X amount of dollars for 10 pounds, you have to buy twice as much, pay more for shipping, and spend more time to broadcast that to get the same amount of something that has 80% germination rate, like our switchgrass. We have 80% germinate, only 10% of our switchgrass uh, right now is actual hard seed. So 90% of that is soft seed and available for germination immediately with rain. About 10 days, two weeks, they'll germinate with effective rain. So read your label and that, that applies to every form of seed. Always look at your inert matter and any kind of food plot seed. We see a lot of food plot seed. We collect labels, but 25 to 30% plus of inert matter. That means 30% inert matter. That means you only get seven pounds of seed out of 10 pounds. It's not like a, a magic trick thing or anything that, yeah, this is normal. No, it's not. They do it to improve profit margins. That's why some companies offer free shipping for seed because their seed's so cheap, they can afford to give you that shipping for free, meaning they're still paying for shipping. $18 to go from XYZ state to XYZ state, they're still paying $18, but they can give you the shipping free because their seed is so cheap and with fillers that they're not actually putting seed in the back. So they can make it sound like they're giving it to you, but nothing's free in life. Timing is everything when it comes to switchgrass. We have steps that I'll talk about here in a second that are tried and true. But if you don't follow the steps and don't do it at the right time, your switchgrass will fail likely or have a great chance of failing. And you know why switchgrass, why people fail the most is they just give up on it. It usually grows unless there's some strange reason it didn't. Uh, seed was damaged, you sprayed too late with Roundup, killed it when it was actually coming up. Too much compaction will just give you shorter switch. Poor soils, you just get smaller switch. It still should grow. So the reason it fails a lot of times people give up, but they give up because they can't see it. They don't know it's there. They don't know it's there because there's so many weeds. So if you follow the steps, you'll have a nice clean stand of switch. It's easy to see the switch and pick it out. You'll know it's there and a lot less likely you'll fail, especially when you can see it, let alone taking care of your weeds. So timing is everything when it comes to following switch. And so what I won't tell you is for XYZ state that you need to spray simazine by this date. Simazine is a pre-emergent. You need to spray it before spring green up. That's the date. Spring green up can vary by four to five weeks every single year. So you have to determine when that is. When the ground is soft, there's no frost or freeze in it, you can spray simazine. It'll be in the soil for at least 60 days. Follow the steps. This is really critical. You have to follow the steps. So many times someone will contact us um, and say, you know what, I followed the steps in your video and it didn't grow. And I'll say, when did you spray your simazine? Well, we did everything but the simazine. Well, when did you mow when you had weeds in it in July? Well, we haven't mowed yet. Did you spray the Roundup 2,4-D? Someone else will say, no, we didn't do that, but we did the simazine. Well, there's a reason I say to do simazine 2,4-D and 2,4-D at different times, which we'll talk about here in a second. Because if you follow the steps, you'll get a successful stand of switch grade. So there's not a lot of guesswork in this, folks. But you have to follow the steps. You have to take care of it. You have to baby it a little bit more than maybe some plantings are used to. It's obviously a lot different than throwing 200 pounds of rye down around Labor Day and enjoying a green food plot of rye. It's going to grow really easy. 
You have to maintain it, baby it, and then when you take care of it, we've seen switchgrass last for 20 years. I have switchgrass in Wisconsin that's uh, from 2014. It's still there. It's doing really well. Dylan and I, I think we planted switchgrass in 2016. 2016 and 2017. And then the 2017 stuff was so thick going into the spring, we actually had rabbit pellets under it. So that was just one year old then, one growing season. It can it can grow really well. It lasts for many, many years. People say, well, switchgrass is expensive. Not when you buy quality seed and you expect a quality stand and you take care of it and it lasts for 20 years. Think about your cost per year for food plot seed compared to switchgrass seed. Yeah, it might be uh, more expensive seed for seed, pound for pound for the switchgrass, but in the end, or acre per acre is a better way to look at it. But in the end, you have to apply fertilizer for food plots. You typically do not for switchgrass. Sometimes when it's a peaked green color, during August, you could apply 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is basically 100 pounds of urea, 4600. But most of the time, you don't even have to apply fertilizer. You do on food plots. So your fertilizer cost could be $100 an acre or more just for fertilizer costs. You don't have to do that with switchgrass. Switchgrass is about the same price as a food plot. Food plots you plant every year most of the time if you have good ones, let alone corn or beans. It's even more expensive. So you have to follow these steps and you will find success. The first step, doesn't matter if it's on ag ground from the previous year, a food plot or a weedy field or a bare spot that you burned down the year before, always recommend Simazine. It's a pre-emergent before spring green up. What's the date in your area? Before spring green up. There's no set date. Right now we just got 10 inches of snow last week. I think Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right in there. That pushed our spring back a little bit. I've seen the spring vary here where people are mowing their lawns end of March one year and not till early May the next year. Really just depends on the spring. But bottom line, simazine before spring green up. Once green is in the woods, it's too late. So right after the snow melts, we get frost freeze, it's gone, it's out of the ground. The ground is actually pliable, meaning It'll soak up the simazine. There's actually soil that you can reach down and grab. It's not frozen. That's a great time to spray. It'll absorb into the soil. And then again, it stays there for 60 days plus. So it really helps really lay that foundation for eliminating the weeds right off the bat. Now, when the weeds do show, because they will, it doesn't matter if you spray simazine or not. There'll be weeds that show. There'll be less weeds, fewer weeds. If you spray simazine, that's the idea. But 2,4-D and Roundup, that takes place when the weeds are 10, 12 inches high after spring green up and weeds are growing aggressively. It's not a snowy day, it's not flurries, it's not frost freeze. It's a decent day, 50, 60, sunny out, and you know those weeds are really popping. It's a time when you're rye, if you have rye on the ground, it's really popping, really, really coming up the rye from the year before the winter rye, fall rye, not rye grass. But they're really popping, that's a great time for Simazine's three quarts per acre, Spray it by yourself, by itself. Then 2,4-D and Roundup, glyphosate. Glyphosate at two quarts per acre and 2,4-D at one pint per acre. You can mix the two. You're spraying that, getting that first initial weed kill. Then I recommend a third kill on ground that is just a weedy field. You can establish switchgrass pretty well in a weedy field, but I like that extra step. You don't have to do that step on chemically controlled ground or prepared ground from the year before meaning you still hit it with simazine, you hit it with Roundup and 2,4-D. And in that case, you could frost seed. You know, frost seed or not, I'd frost seed if it's on chemically prepared soil going into the spring. Not the simazine you're adding then or the 2,4-D Roundup, but it was prepared in the fall and summer of the year before. Again, a food plot, an ag field, great examples of already prepared soil, chemically controlled, that you can frost seed into, get your simazine, your Roundup 2,4-D spraying, you'll have a really good catch with not very many weeds. If it's a weedy field, grass field, you haven't maintained the area, I recommend simazine, 2,4-D Roundup, and then 2,4-D Roundup again. And instead of frost seeding, I would recommend a week after that you put your Roundup 2,4-D down in the spring, the second spring of that, then you'd apply and broadcast eight pounds per acre of switchgrass. So, and you still can, we have soft seed in ours, so you get a lot of rain, it'll germinate. So we've actually put uh, switchgrass down in the corner, we call it the redneck corner back here on the land. That was the uh, beginning of June the first year, right around beginning to mid-June that we put uh, switchgrass down. We had a great stand. We had good rain for about 10 days. I'd say two to three inches of rain off and on. We had quarter inch, half inch, three quarter inch here and there. Uh, great germinating rain. We had a, it's one of our best, thickest stands of switchgrass. Almost a little too thick. Follow that eight pounds per acre, folks. If you have a little left in the bag, I wouldn't go 15 pounds just because you have it because it makes a weaker stand. 
Hope that makes sense. So I hope this makes sense too. Do you frost seed or not? Well, if it's on chemically controlled ground or location from the fall and summer before, frost seed. Frost seed can take place in October all the way through March, April, whenever you get on the ground because the simazine won't hurt it and you roll a 2,4-D in Roundup that you spray because it's not germinated yet. If it's germinated in the Roundup, the 2,4-D will kill it if it's within that 10-day window, two-week window. You know, a lot of times, um, Dylan brought this up, you get a lot of questions about tilling. Should you till it? Last thing you want to do is you take care of the weed, take control of the weeds and then you till it up and create a bunch more weeds. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a recipe for disaster because you're taking care of weeds, now you just tilled it up, brought up a bunch of weed seeds, and now you have to deal with weeds again. Then you have to simazine, 2,4-D, 2,4-D again, now you're pushing it back so far that you shouldn't even plant until the following year. So literally you could set yourself back an entire year by disking or tilling. As long as you get good seed to soil contact in October through May, even early June in the northern areas, and you have that rain coming, that's all you need to worry about. Switchgrass germinates really well. It takes a little time to germinate, especially if you have those soft seed counts and you're looking at your label pint by actually buying quality seed instead of junk. And, and you know, a lot of those companies that are selling that, they're selling it for a lower price. They're not charging you $24, $25 a pound overall and then giving you junk. They're usually charging you $12 a pound, $11, $13 a pound, and they're giving you junk because they paid so much less. So they're just looking at profit margins. You know, this they keep this profit margin roughly around every seed blend they sell. And if they buy it cheaper, they can sell it cheaper. That's what we do. You know, if we buy it more expensive, we have to push the cost up. If we buy it for cheaper, we push the cost down. So we're always looking for that whatever markup that we, our strategy, follows for how we can run a business. So, and that's what they do too. And so if you find cheap seed, there's usually a reason. You get free shipping, there's usually a reason. Thatch, if you have thatch on there, well, a lot of times people don't have too much thatch. Now, if you do, where you can't imagine that seed getting onto the soil, then you probably need to, if I had that, I'd probably spray simazine on it just to get that weed control. I'd probably disc it up or till it if I thought seed couldn't get on the soil immediately as soon as I, it's dry enough for me literally to get in there. Then I'd wait a month, hit it with 2,4-D and round up, and I might wait another month. And you can kind of see when you disc and till, you can really push it back to where you shouldn't be planting. So if that took place where that, that tilling and the waiting a couple months for it to green up, kill, green up, kill. If that gets me into May, that'd be okay. If it gets me early June, okay, if there's rain coming. But if it gets me into mid-June and there's no rain in the forecast, really bad time to throw the switchgrass out and you probably should have just waited because a lot of times what that thatch does, you put the seed down on the soil, the seed dries out, blows away, turns to dust. That seed is a living organism. It's not going to turn to dust. It's gonna lay there, eventually get on the soil. And if you're killing, killing new weeds that are coming in, Unless most areas do not have thatch unless it's been previously mowed and the thatch is just laying there. And that's why a lot of times I don't like mowing before we do this. I want the weeds vertically standing. So when I broadcast my switchgrass, the dead drying weeds, the switchgrass just goes down. If I mow it and create an actual thatch layer because I created that after I just mowed the weeds that came up, then that seed can't get down through that thatch. So I, that's why I like keeping those uh, weeds vertical. It's no different when we start food plots out here and we're putting them in an early successional growth area where we have patches of gray dogwood. I don't mow the gray dogwood down typically. I spray it, spray it, get it killed. You can throw the seed in there. We actually had brassica growing up in the gray dogwood and patches the first year. Unless I hit it early and I mow, spray, mow, spray, and I'm not just taking care of it in August and planting into it, like we did the first year or July, we're actually mowing it down in April as soon as we can get to it and then spraying new growth, spraying new growth, spraying new growth, really getting a good seed bed going into the fall where we can plant our fall crops. When this comes up, you have to mow if you see weeds. So when it gets into the end of July, you know, the, the whole idea is you're, you're using your chemical process, you're following the steps, but you can have one area you did it the same as another area and you'll have foxtail in one area, uh, noxious grass, and, uh, and not in another area. So you have to mow. You're typically mowing that first year, mid-July, somewhere around there. And what you're watching for is that switchgrass growing up in the stand. You'll see the switchgrass coming up here. It's kind of wispy coming in that leaf. And you'll see other weeds up higher and broad leaves mixing in. So that's when you want to cut it down so it's all even. And when you cut that down in July sometime, that switchgrass is starting to see just a little bit of growth in June, a little bit more in July, a lot in August. And you wanna hit it right there in that time where that seat, that switchgrass is about ready to take off. You're mowing it, you're getting it down even with the weeds, grasses, broadleafs that are weeds. So then it then 
out pieces them. And a lot of times you mow in middle of July on a good stand, it's been taken care of, you have little weeds in it. You come back in early August and all that switchgrass is now above that line of weeds and growing rapidly and it's going to be good for life. It'll be good for a decade then if you see that. And that's what you'll see most of the time if you follow these steps. If you don't, you can mow the following year. You can spray simazine the following year, simazine as needed. You might need simazine the second year, the third year. If you see weeds in there, don't hesitate to spray simazine on it before spring green up. It won't hurt your switch, but it'll take care of percentage of the weeds, especially broadleaf. So we'll hit simazine on some of our, or most of our plots out here in Minnesota. I don't think we'll hit any in some areas, and then some areas won't hit in Wisconsin. Might not even hit Wisconsin this year. And then I'll mow in early May, late April when those weeds are 10, 12 inches high on fields that have more weeds in them. And a lot of those fields I won't ever touch again for years uh, many years and even if they did they'll mow it and hit simazine again in five years or eight years but bottom line is they'll be taken care of but you still have to watch if you have weeds spray simazine in the spring mow in may that year end of april and uh, so simazine is needed and mow 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 is needed you can mow three times in one year if you want to drill versus broadcast this is always a good question you can make a case for either brandon from first choice food plots who we recommend for a lot of people in the midwest to use your uh, custom food plotter uh, habitat improvements bulldozing food plots whatever it might be um, he really does it all but what we recommend is really let the timing of what you're doing your resources dictate we have switchgrass that's been drilled out here it does really well we have switchgrass that's been broadcast and frost seeded frost seeded broadcast in early june june and then some that's been frosted in february so it really just depends um if i didn't have a chemically controlled weed bed and i had someone that could drill that or um chemically controlled area i'd still simazine you could um also then hit it with roundup 24d roundup 24d and around that second sprain time even waiting a week i'd drill that switchgrass in um Maybe if you have a thatch concern, find someone with a drill. But you might find that when you're spraying simazine, spraying Roundup 24D, and then you're getting that third spraying in with Roundup 24D, that by then there's a lot of soil exposure. You can throw your seed right down on the ground. So just kind of let it be a timing of resources. But bottom line, doesn't matter if you drill or broadcast, you still have to have the same level of weed control. That's just more of a convenience factor, resources question when you think of that. So really, you know, a lot of steps here, I know but they're tried and true steps that'll give you an effective and easily predictable level of success with switchgrass. So I encourage you to don't shy away from switchgrass. Don't be afraid of it. It's something that's a great alternative to traditional screening. We have an annual screening blend. We call it deer fence and that's an annual. So you have to replant it every single year. It zaps a lot of nutrients out of the soil. A lot of times we have a food plot. We have a food plot right here. Dylan, am I okay to be over oh, here? Yeah. So if there's food plot right here, and this is an outside edge that's a people area 200 yards away, and it's flat or the elevation is such that we could use screening on this end to block off so deer here don't see us out here, then what I recommend is maybe that outside layer, if six, seven feet high of switchgrass will work for you, that outside layer would be switch. And then, and that's a perennial. And then this inside layer would be our deer fence or a screening blend of your choice. And that right there, you'd have that switchgrass outside layer within two to three years if you're taking care of it. You can take the deer fence down, the, the screening blend, the annual on the inside. You don't have to plant it again. You plant it for two years, somewhere on there at most. And then that converts to food plot space. So that's a good way, kind of a one-two punch. You have switchgrass on the outside, screening blend on the inside, both at least 10 feet wide, 10 to 12 feet wide. And then you just get rid of one, get rid of the deer fence on the inside, turn it into food plot when you, the switchgrass is effective. Whether it's access routes, we'll take switchgrass, put it in pockets and field. I have some pockets to put out there this year on the property where we're filling in an area. Big Rock Trees is coming out. We're gonna put 30 foot circles with shrubs, more deer brow shrubs. We'll have to fence it for two years. We have that going on in five areas out here this year. So that's a new project for us. But uh, we have one area we're filling in, just trying to make it more bedding cover and uh, holding more wildlife. And uh, so the switchgrass pockets are a big part of that because because it gives instant cover. Like I said, the one growing season that gave rabbits a place to hide out in a very open field, just with one growing season. So that's why I like switchgrass. 
Uh, it's a base form of cover. It's something that you can turn an old field into switchgrass. Then you put about 50% in pockets on the inside, eighth of an acre, quarter acre, half acre pockets, put pollinator blend in there, put big rock trees, shrubs, cuttings, whatever it might be, briars. There's lots of different options or let it go to early successional growth, but you have to have that base form of cover in that switchgrass or something else. Maybe you already have red cedar pockets, whatever it might be, um, some type of shrub, pines. Then you take those pockets out and convert it to something else. But bottom line, same concept. You can switch grass, use switch grass for a lot of different needs, especially screening for your axis, screening for deer bedding, long lines of escape cover for critters, deer, wildlife, bunnies, pheasants. It's a lot of use, but don't ever shy away from it because if you follow the steps, you'll find an easily predictable level of success for this planting season. Take care of it and it'll reward you for decades to come. And that's a fact something you can really do and enjoy with switchgrass so look at it per year it doesn't cost that much you know some of the blends the same blend you'd plant in kentucky is not the same blend you should plant in michigan which is not the same blend that you should plant in north dakota there's different varieties that's why we have a western blend a northern blend a southern blend make sure to send us an email uh wes our seed guy he's our full-time employee He'll be taking care of a lot of the questions. Jen does too, Jesse a few too. But there are a lot of questions coming in. We want to help you make sure you get your right seed. We can't tell you what to plant in your area, but we can sure help you get pointed in the right direction um, for what you have going on. And again, we have lots of resources on here to help you out. So check out WHS Wildlife Blends for all your planting needs, including the switchgrass, pollinators that we talk about, and all your food plots. We have about 12 different products for you on WHS Wildlife Blends. You can get that from our store on the main page and I hope all this helps you out. You don't have to buy any seed from us, but when you buy it, I want to make sure you do it right, whether it's from us or someone else. And there's no reason to fail with switchgrass because it offers an easily predictable level of success every single year. You just have to follow the steps, make sure you get your timing down for your area, and you'll find success with switchgrass this season and beyond. Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.